Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie, pronouns she, her. I identify as a biracial Latina woman. I'm on Muncie Lenape land, and I have short, curly brown hair with bangs. I'm wearing a pink sweater with a white background behind me with pictures on the wall. First, thank you for joining us for this completely digital 2022 symposium held on the WOVA platform. As we are at the mercy of technology, we want to remind you that there may be delays, sound issues, and changing circumstances that may occur during our time together. We invite you to extend us and each other grace and patience. Second, ASL interpreters from Sign Nexus and closed captioning services provided by the Viscardi Center will be available throughout the session. A stream to text link will also be available and posted in the chat for further reference. We will also post speaker information in the description below and under the speakers module on the left side of your WOVA web app or in the menu of your WOVA mobile app. This information is also available on our website. Third, feel free to post comments you want to share with the community in the chat section to the right of this event room, Dance Slash NYC moderators will be interacting with you there. For this session, we have a unique format in which we will lock the Zoom chat during part one, the moderated conversation, and unlock the Zoom chat during part two, the workshop. The WOVA chat will remain open the whole time, so feel free to share your thoughts there throughout the session. After the session ends, there will be a session follow-up in the community section of, the, of WOVA where you can continue the conversation. Lastly, we hope you will help to amplify these conversations. So repost, tag us, and share your takeaways on Twitter, which is at DanceNYC, Instagram at Dance.NYC, and Facebook, which is Dance slash NYC, using the hashtag Dance Symposium. And now, we enter artists considering their own legacy, independent dance creators whose works live outside of mainstream or famed platforms, often don't have the luxury of having their works lauded, cat cataloged, or preserved. In this session, individual dance artists reflect on their artistic practices, processes, and repertory, considering the impacts they wish to have on their communities, and if, or how their artistry will live on past them. The conversation is followed by a workshop hosted by Dance Slash USA's archiving and preservation team entitled Building Your Legacy, a workshop for living archives. And now we welcome senior fellow at Metropolitan Museum of Art, Dr. Megan Metcalf, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for that welcome. Um, my name is Megan Metcalf. I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently on the Lenape Island of Manhattan in Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland. I'm a white woman with a short haircut wearing a blue sweater and glasses I'm in front of a brick wall and bookshelves. Um, I, I'd like for each of our panelists to um, give us our brief introduction and we'll go in the order that we're on the title slide. So. David first, and then Muna, and then Zone. I'm absolutely honored to um, be with these um, distinguished members of the dance community. So thank you so much. And then we will jump into introductions of our respective practices. Hi, um, my name is David Thompson. I'm an artist, advocate, mentor, educator. My pronouns are he, him, they. I am a non-disabled, dark-complexioned Black man of Caribbean heritage with clean-shaven, bald head, and I'm wearing glasses. I'm wearing a dark blue collared shirt. My blurred background is white and cream colored. Hi, my name is Muna Sang. I'm very pleased to be here with you all. And I am a choreographer, dancer, founder, and artistic director of Munasang Dance Projects. And I also manage the estate archive of my late brother, the photographer, Sang Kwang Chi. I am uh, an Asian descent 
and uh, I use the pronoun she, her. I am on the land of Munsi Lenape. I am considering myself a global citizen as a global artist, even though my heritage is Chinese and I hold American and Canadian passports. Thank you. Oh, I forgot my background. <laughs> I'm, my background is blurred and I'm wearing a white shirt and a blue blazer. Okay. I have short hair and glasses. Thank you so much, Muna. This is Megan again. Um, we have a technical difficulty for our panelists. So we're just gonna wait for a moment so we can see if um, we can connect. And um, after that, if, if we have still waiting through the pause, then maybe we'll launch into a little bit more of our introductions. Thank you again to everyone for being with us today for this conversation. All right, um, while we're working out that technical difficulty, this is Megan again, while we're working out that technical difficulty. Um, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you, yes. Zone, Hi. are you with us? Yeah. Uh, Fantastic. Okay, um, my name is Mark Pickett, AKA Zone TDK. Um, I'm the captain of the New York City Transformers Breakdance Club, and I also choreograph all the routines. I'm coming from the Bronx, New York, Fort Apache, and uh, I'm an African-American male, and I'm wearing a uh, blue Yank, uh, blue Giants jersey and my glasses, and my head's been scully. Hello, everybody. Hi. Wonderful. Thank you, Zone. Um, so what I'd like to do first is give you each like something of a luxurious amount of time to describe um, your practice and, and its relationship to archiving or um, preservation or legacy. Um, and again, why don't we go in that order that we were on the um, title slide? So that would be David, um, Muna, and then Zone. Um, thank you again for being here. I feel very honored to be learning from you today and excited to move with, forward with our conversation. And then after that, we can unfold somewhat organically based on the questions that arise. Um, so I'm done with my part for now. David, do you want to take it from here? Sure. Thank you, Megan. And, and it is a pleasure to be here and in conversation with everyone. Um, so, um, in brief, my history uh, dealing with archives actually started out with my very first job. I worked in a, the Central Research and Reference Library in the Bronx. And so that's where I got my first introduction actually into book preservation. Um, since then, I have worked in the fields, I've worked in publishing, um, and I also worked in a uh, gallery, um, Giordane Paper Mill. Um, which also dealt with um, the idea of, as a visual arts, preservation of materials and um, tracking of materials, which is, seems very central to the visual arts field. Um, I think of preservation and its relationship as being um, uh, concepts of presence and absence. You know, if something isn't, doesn't exist or you're not aware that it exists, then it is actually absent from the canon and it's absent from accessibility to those to learn about history. Um, my other uh, large relationship to preservation was I helped build alongside with Corey Olinghouse, the archive, I built the Tricia Brown archive database. And this was kind of a 10 year project that I was invited to join Corey to um, build. And uh, 
my history is I've, I've done database work um, for since the early 80s. And so I just brought that expertise into the fold. And I realized that um, in building databases, you have to understand the materials. It's not just building a simple container. It's really understanding the relationality of the work. And my history of having danced with the company for seven years felt integral in understanding the history of the exceptions and the way the material was built, the, the relationship of materials across the repertory and the namings um, and, and such that allowed me to create a container that um, actually addressed the particularities and the nature of how the work was built and how it should be seen. Um, I think partially when we think about archiving, it's not just tracking material, it's understanding the relationship between materials and historically why things happened in certain ways and, um, and how to illuminate that. Um, I, to answer your question, I think uh, these ideas of um, how I relate to it is an ongoing process. I feel like it requires time and maintenance that we don't always are aware of. Um, and uh, the value of how it operates, say, as ephemera, um, whether it's um, the tracking of performances or of the value of the ephemera in a larger historical context, as well as the, the value of the ephemera as a commodity that can be sold or leveraged in a financial way um, that we don't always look at. And I think it, depending on the discipline, it is managed and looked upon in alternative fashions. Um, and then I, finally, just I'm sort of covering a wide ground, this idea of interdisciplinary work, how do you archive something that is not the usual? And what actually aspects of the work are important to archive and how is the best way of capturing a work, the nature of what it is, because maybe it's built on a score. And I think there are a number of ways that different artists think about this, whether it's Tino Segal or Marina Abramovich, Trisha Brown, or any other artist. Um, and it's th these, I think, are larger discussions, especially as we move forward and looking into digital formats and other platforms in which the engagement can be multiformed. Uh, so then with that, I will pass it along to um, Muna. Thank you, David. Wow. Um, there was so much to unpack there. <laughs> um, I'm Muna. Uh, I've been um, an artist since I was a teenager as an immigrant from Hong Kong to Vancouver. And um, when I look back at the first work that I created um, and how I have photos from that uh, performance, I realized, wow, if I didn't have that, I might not even remember it. So um, just, you know, personally, I've been on this long journey. Uh, I am uh, in my um, sixth decade, uh, nearing 70 years old. And um, along the way of creating, I've realized that the importance of an archive is very difficult for a working artist because you're subjective with the work. You're in it, you judge it, you, you have the experience of it. Um, but an archive and the process of archiving in a way is objectifying that. And being able to say, what am I creating that the world can remember or what is legacy? And, uh, you know, it sounds like a lot of ego to think, well, you know, why have a legacy? But um, uh, I also was like thrown into the world of archiving when my older brother um, at age 39 uh, died of AIDS and said, you take care of my work. I only had time to make the work. I didn't, I don't have time to preserve it. And so um, I think like what the multi entry points uh, 
how do we enter? And as David says, uh, what are what are the, these containers that we can build to help us um, not only take care of our own work, but to pass it on? And uh, I think that's a responsibility of an artist, not only to make work, but to uh, create a community, create um, the assets that is our cultural, that makes our cultural history. And, um, you know, this is Dance NYC. So we're talking about New York dance history. Okay, I've been here since 1978. Um, it is now, you know, the, all, we're in the 2022. Um, so what are the values of, that have been created in my community and in my late brother's community? How can it go beyond loco? How can it um, be shared with the world uh, across different cultures and across different disciplines? Um, we're, <clears throat> you know, we have downtown dance, we have uptown dance, we have all these different uh, manifestations. So is a treasure to be shared. And I think that's what archiving ultimately is. So with that, I pass it on. Thank you. Thank you, Luna. Okay, uh, this is uh, Mark Pickett, alias known as Zone TDK from the Transformers. Um, I've been breakdancing most of my life. I started in 1973. Uh, when it wasn't very popular and growing up in the South Bronx, we basically did it because we didn't have, we couldn't afford toys and other things that most, uh, most children with working parents can afford to buy them to toys. But at the time in 1973, most of the Bronx was on welfare and public assistance. And um, we didn't have toys. And um, we started in the playgrounds doing it. Um, it wasn't until I uh, was first asked to go on tour, and that's when they laid the uh, Alaskan pipeline. When the two pipelines had met, uh, they wanted like break dancers and hookers for the grand celebration up in uh, Anchorage, Alaska. And I went up there for two weeks, and I came back at the age of 16, I came back with $1,700. Uh, for two weeks work, I basically stayed in the hotel until it was time to perform. And um, I didn't know what Alaska was like at the time. But my point is, had I documented my experiences at the time, uh, I would have so much more to go on. And um, at the time, there was no inclination that breakdance would last this long. You know, a lot of people said it was a fast, fad, and um, it was something like a, a novelty, you know, uh, until uh, President Jimmy Carter came to the Bronx and he had a state of emergency saying that the Bronx was so bad and we need artists to come in and we need we need directors and we need politicians to come in and save the Bronx. And we talk in 1977. And um, that's when we started doing shows, breakdancing. And um, even then I didn't document what was going on. And um, uh, we was kind of winging it at the time, me and the whole generation of guys from that era. I am now 57 years old and I've been all over the world twice doing breakdance tours. And it wasn't until this pandemic hit the dance community, and I'm sure it hit everybody's, uh, whatever level, whatever form of dance you did, uh, that I started considering maybe we should uh, have a more better archive of where breakdancing come from and where it started and where I came into with it and what it was like when I came into the field of breakdance. Um, I remember times when my mom was like, this is going nowhere, stay in school and uh, run track. And I was a fencing major. Uh, I was one of the top four fences, fencing guys in black American fencing guys in the 1980, 1983, 1984. 
So I uh, had an opportunity to join an Olympic team. And that's when the breakdance opportunity came up to go to Alaska. Um, at the time, being 16, it was thrilling. But now I'm looking back on it. And I need to fill in the gaps to what we has, have done in the breakdance community uh, collectively, you know, cause it's not just me, it's, it's a, a million other breakdancers that put other breakdancers on and they're, they're gone. Most of them are deceased. The ones that started breakdancing, they're gone now. And um, um, I think I'm the last generation of the first breakdancers that evolved. And um, uh, I like the platform that we're on today. And I think we can do a lot more as far as the dance community. Um, now we're sharing dance and culturalistically with each other. You know, when I was coming up, break dancers didn't talk to ballet dancers, didn't talk to tap dancers. Uh, uh, break dancers wasn't getting gigs. Ballet dancers were getting the gigs. Tap dancers were getting the gigs. Uh, modern and jazz dancers were getting all the gigs. And um, when you look now, it's like when you go to an audition now, it's like if you don't know break dance or you don't know hip hop, uh, they actually send you right out the door. You know, I've studied with the Harkness and uh, I studied with Lee Theodore's American Dance Machine uh, to pay the bills back in the day, you know. And um, I strayed away from dance for a while because it wasn't paying the bills as a break dancer. We're talking from 1988 to about 1993. It just wasn't paying the bills. So I went off and started doing some music. I went into the music business for a while until I can um, raise some money to finance my cause, which was to connect breakdancing to the rest of the world, you know, and I started touring a lot, Germany, Italy, China, uh, Romania. And um, with the pandemic in effect, I feel like I'm gonna rep be representing most of the breakdancers from around the world, from different nationalities. And then with that being said, I mean, there's more to go on, but I don't want to take over the whole platform. I'm going to pass it to the next. Which is, which is me, I think. Thank you each, each of you for that, those incredible introductions to what you're doing and, and your, um, your timeline in doing that. I'm struck by how each of you has like a leadership role um, in a particular community or with respect to particular um, bodies of work. Um, I wonder, and I'm also struck that you each have had experience like different inflection points. So um, Mark, the pandemic was a chance for you to reflect upon um, your, your community and your community's history. Um, Muna, you had an inflection point um, with your brother's death, which you described so beautifully. Um, I, I don't, I'm running out of time. I don't have the time. And David, you've had um, these inflection points professionally when you've been involved, it sounds like, um, when you've, you know, when you've been involved with, um, you know, various archiving projects in, in like sort of a specific limited way. So I guess I wonder if each of you would talk a little bit about um, either how you maybe expand a little bit on that leadership role that you have and or um, that inflection point, um, what those things sort of made obvious to you or um, was, were raising for you. Um, and I, if anyone feel free to pick up that, that question, if you like, um, if, that, if that triggers any thoughts for you. Hi, this is David. Um, uh, there are a number of points. I feel like this, uh, subject matter is actually obviously, as you know, quite broad and dense. And I think it, uh, in one way, and I think Muna totally understands this because she, she's actually balancing out the visual arts um, archive of her brother versus her archive as well as a performer. And the different qualities of the ephemera of like one 
becomes uh, what the commodification of one versus the other is and understanding how like within the visual arts field that um, concept of archiving is something that's built into the process. Whereas in the dance field, it's less built in and also it becomes um, another labor that uh, is not really framed. And one of the things I wanted to bring up is that creating an archive is not just for a legacy, but it's for the present and for yourself. My ability to be able to look back on my work and review that also tells me and shows me sort of the progression that I've made and also what maybe the underlying threads within my work can be. Um, I think that um, given the platforms, the digital platforms that we have, there's a, a question of how we choose to allow, um, allow the work to go out into the world and how much control we have over that as well. I think that's another issue um, that I think affects all of us because then the fact that somebody else picking up your image and using it without you knowing becomes, you've, you've lost the power from that. And um, I think, um, and I'd really be curious to hear the Dance USA panel workshop because there is um, the idea that we are creating content and whether you're doing it on Instagram or Facebook and realizing that you don't actually own that content once you put it on that platform. And so the question of ownership within that and the rights and the copyrights are something that almost becomes onerous to track. So mm -hmm. while we're creating a legacy, I think there's also the question of what are the limits to it and what should we be aware of as we're doing this? Yeah, I'd like to pick up on that, um, David. Uh, point. This is Muna. Um, <laughs> it's a copyright issue uh, is something that um, you know most of us don't think about when we're creating the work. But uh, copyright law has sort of been changing over the years, um, and so now, in a way, you don't have to register with the Library of Congress in order to own it, you create it, you own it. However, this digital world um, of uh, social media, et cetera, uh, and I think is it Google or Apple or whoever, the cloud, you know, they, they can grab your content. And, uh, and so uh, it's always balancing and archiving uh, how you distribute, how you disseminate and how you maintain control. Um, and it's a very tricky dance of uh, what, how do you decide um, uh, how to control your ownership. But um, on a larger picture, um, I think that the, this really unpacking what is an archive. An archive is who you are. An archive is is um, you know you can make an archive out of your personal life. You can make an archive out of you know totally conceptual uh, theories. Um, but what happens is that is that who you are and is defined by your archive. Uh, if you're looking back, and also an archive can be a living creative source. And um, what I mean by that is. Uh, I've made works out of biographical material uh, in my own practice. And um, David Thompson was actually <laughs> in Stella, which is the piece I made about my mother. And uh, he was one of four Stellas. Now I, I'm also wearing a jade uh, with, of a little dragon. It's uh, what my father wore and what my grandfather wore. And so I, I keep that on me because this is my heritage. And so how we, you know, whether it's material or whether it's in uh, digital form and it's stored at the Library of Congress or 
uh, Library of Performing Arts at Lincoln Center. Um, we are caretakers of these things. And um, we can also use this uh, as creative platform to jump off and continue our work and uh, you know, make, make new work out of it. So it's self-generative as well. Uh, so, you know, it's, it can get philosophical or we can like talk more technically, practically, uh, what, are the, what are the practices? What are the skills? Um, what are the, uh, you know, uh, uh, tools like databases, Excels, uh, digify, digitize, digitizing our work, uh, preserving, conserving, you know, videotapes from 1970s. I mean, I have reel to reel videotape, you know, or through the different formats, how do you, you know, I don't even know if the signals are still there, right? So, um, so we can, we can go in many directions. So I'll pass it on. Thank you. Um, when I started breakdancing, uh, going back to intellectual properties and dancers' copyrights, uh, we kind of winged it. We saw a performance. If it was if the performance won the comp competition back then or the contest back then, uh, you worked in we, you worked on it like that because it was no formal training for breakdance. Uh, we came and sort of through the back door of entertainment. Um, as the years went on now, breakdancing is uh, becoming more acceptable as a formal form of dance, you know, going back to when um, the Floor Masters and the Rock Steady crew performed at the Kennedy, Kennedy Center Honors with, with Ronald Reagan and Sidney Poitier. Then after that, they came into the Bronx, started shooting documentaries and movies about breakdance and um, hip hop, you know, excuse me for throwing the word hip hop with the two fingers like that, because um, now that it is commercialized, going back to uh, intellectual property and copyrights, uh, now that breakdancing is popular around the world, uh, and with the, with the invention of TikTok and Instagram videos, and it, it's like nobody has to go through formal training in dance anymore to, I you say, quote, uh, make it. Because uh, I've known dancers that uh, study all forms of dance from modern jazz tap, still trying to get put on in the, in the business. And then you have today some 16 year old throw a TikTok video up and he's get, he gets like a million views and for 30 seconds or 15 seconds of dancing. And um, all, the, all the underlying stuff about dance is no longer there. How did he learn those moves? You know, are those his moves? When I was coming up, I watched the Nicholas Brothers, you know, uh, I watched Bojangles, I watched Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, and this is way before Michael Jackson. Um, the guys was uh, actually breakdancing in the 20s, in the 30s, in the 40s, in the old black and white movies, they were breakdancing. It was just a different beat and they were more formal. It was in tuxedos, but if you put them in an Adidas suit, you know, as a matter of fact, when I was young, I used to watch the, uh, the old Nicholas Brother films and I would, I would mute the TV and play my boom box. I would play Apache and watch the Nicholas Brothers in their tuxedos dancing to Apache. Um, and I think the same thing is going on now as far as copyrights and intellectual property, who created the move, who created the dance, like a um, uh, perfect example of people and dancers and choreographers choreographers holding on to their intellectual property is Alvin Ailey and um, uh, groups like Alvin Ailey, you know, who was breaking a balls since the 60s, the 50s, the 70s. He only got put on in the 70s. And I, I feel like we was working toward that in breakdance, the whole field of breakdance, you know, 
no matter what country you in, we were all going through the same thing at the same time. Nobody hold claims over anybody's move. Personally, I learned my moves. And I'm glad the guys didn't sue me, but I learned from the dynamic breakers, uh, New York City breakers, dynamic dolls, all girls group, and um, rock steady crew. I thought as, as, as being a black male that we have to take more initiative in getting out there so, you know, it was, it was a rebel-like attitude from 1983 to about 1988. We're fighting for this recognition of this art form that we're doing. And um, all across the board, we're not getting no, no exception. I mean, I, I've done more, te- I've got more co- television commercial gigs from performing on the streets than I did going into auditions. The very same audition I would go to to try to audition for a commercial, I would get kicked out or uh, we're not, we're going in a different direction. That's what what they say in showbiz. We're going in a different direction. That means pick up your resume and leave. But when I started street performing uh, around Central Park, Lincoln Center, World Trade Center, uh, I would get commercials Guys would come up to me and say, hey, we're doing a commercial, we're ginseng up, it's a soda commercial, we just need you to drink the soda, and uh, after you drink the soda, flip around a bit. Those are my early days of commercial making as far as incorporating breakdance into the mainstream. And even then, you got to check, but you knew you wasn't scratching the surface nowhere, Uh, so. And I I didn't think that there were going to be other leaders other than me to go out there and, and push this envelope, you know? Because once you, once you make it, you stop looking back at the people trying to make it. So I was going in and out. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm making money, but I'm going back to get my other dancers from around the world, you know? Uh, I was sort of the ambassador for breakdancers. Whenever breakdancers came to New York, they came to my house, whether they came from Germany, China, Japan, uh, Russia, they would all come to my house. And this is 1985, 86. And um, my mom would go crazy, like, who are these people coming into my house? Are they Christians? Are they doing the devil dance? You know, my mom was a born again Christian. So break dancing was somewhat the devil's dance at the time. But she didn't know that it got me out of so many things I could have been getting into. And the fact that I, I've got uh, a German guy, a Japanese guy, a guy from Romania, and they all sleeping in my bedroom. Mm-hmm. And we'd get up and go out and hit Midtown. We'd, you know, we'd do uh, 50th and Broadway. When the, when the Broadway plays have cigarette breaks, we'd go right, run right out in front of the cigarette break, break dance, you know. And then, Mark, Mark, you talking about being on the street is reminding me of the accessibility of this is Megan again of the accessibility of these larger platforms um, that we were just talking about, like digital ones like TikTok or Instagram. Um, that that there's an there's an accessibility that led to um, a certain professional opportunity for you through these platforms. Um, you know, like being out on the street and it was more effective for you than like being in a commercial for, uh, I'm sorry, being in a, an audition, for example. And um, the, these similar tensions still exist. So it's not, so, so it sounds like what you're saying is, is like, it's not completely different um, the way that these, um, you know, like um, Instagram and and internet videos are circulating and the status of the work is in question, the status being like the commercial availability and the way people get paid for that. Um, I, I, just wanna ju- I just wanna note here that um, dance in particular is difficult to copyright because it has to be fixed in another format. And so the way that that happens often is um, through either videotaping or a combination of videotaping and um, like a notation system, which is like, notoriously difficult to um, finance and to, to, to make it happen. Um, and there are people right now who are um, there. 
I, I have supplied some um, links to articles from Dance Magazine and the New York Times about the efforts underway right now to, um, to, make, to make it easier for dance makers to try to um, copyright their choreography or get paid in a more um, ongoing way so that, so that, the, that the like circulation of certain people's dances and its appropriation by other people um, leads to more payment for the originator or is more protected by the originator. But the things each of you have said about um, accessibility is this double-edged thing. Um, and I think each of you has recognized that where it's like um, on the one hand, the creator needs to be protected, like uh, remunerated and um, resourced um, and, and um, just even culturally respected and honored as the originator. And on the other hand, if the work can't circulate, um, that leads to certain limitations. Um, and one final point that I wanna make in this regard, which we can jump off from also, is that there are certain um, formats that are, that are culturally more accessible or not culturally, but even, you know, as a scholar, stuff like photographs and recordings are easier for me to access than um, oral histories, for example, or even learning a practice from someone, um, like an embodied, an embodied transmission rather than, you know, through, through ephemera and so on, is, is, a, is a little bit easier for me at, to access as a scholar. Um, but, but those kinds of things, and David, I think you um, referred to this, you know, in its commodification or commercialization, um, those kinds of things are not available for every practice. Um, I, I have been in the situation of like wanting to write about a certain dance or a certain, a certain historical event. And if the choreographer is not willing to make the recording available or um, make some kinds of materials available, which, which has happened to me and I respect that decision very much, it just makes it less available for me to be able to write about it in a scholarly way. Um, and I, I wish it wasn't that, you know, I wish it wasn't that um, because also I consider scholarship a certain form of stewardship. Um, I don't know if there's any points in there you guys want to jump off on. Um, I, I am, again, conscious of this and in, these inflection points, these, these moments where you're separating yourself as a maker or a performer and having to look onto your practice, um, either through recordings or through, you know, Mark, you're talking about, um, you know, I don't have photographs from that period or I don't have recordings from that period. And it is so hard while you're in the middle of it to be like self-documenting and self like stepping in and out of that role. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I don't know if there's Espe anything you wanna pick up on there or. Hold on a sec, especially when you don't know this art form is gonna progress or it's, it's just a now thing. So you think into yourself as an artist, you know, let me just go out there and splash, you know, all over the canvas and, and where the art falls, that's where the art falls. And then you, you, uh, you realize that it's gotta be some sort of composition to your work, you know. Um, uh, when, you don't, when you don't think something is gonna be around long, you don't document. You know, you think it's just a fad and then all of a sudden, 10, 15 years down the line, it's not a fad, it's, it's, uh, it's a part of the game, you know? So I, I, I like, yeah, um, Mark, I think that that's really true that you often do not know whether what you're doing, this is Muna speaking, uh, you know, we're not always good at capturing or preserving uh, um, and kind of putting down in another form what we create. Um, I, I do think that uh, um, in terms of dance, because it is so ephemeral and it just is time-based and then it's gone, um, that a lot of times I'm just surprised that presenting organizations um, can really help with like, if they wanna produce your, your show, um, if they also think about archiving it, at least doing a documentary, one camera shoot, or, you know, nice to have two cameras, or, you know, because the artist is often not, don't have the, the, the mindset to do it or the resources to do it. And I think as a field that to think of dance preservation, um, you know, photographers, uh, 
uh, uh, painting, uh, it's, it's not so time-based. And so you can go back and you can photograph it later. It doesn't happen with dance. It happens now. And so let's captivate it. And often it's, it's the fact that, um, uh, you know, that we have uh, created uh, a record that that record can be shared. And then you discuss, okay, do I make it free? Do I give free access? Uh, uh, I have a wonderful story of free access actually, because, you know, of course I, I protect my copyright and my work, but um, this is a short story, which I actually uh, am very happy to tell. Um, one of my pieces got on YouTube. I don't know who put it on. It was on YouTube. All of a sudden, uh, my composer for this piece got contacted by a choreographer dancer in Malaysia on the other side of the world saying, I love this work. I want to learn it. And my composer contacts me and goes, this is dancer in Malaysia. Uh, I'm telling her to contact you because you made the piece, you made the dance. And so we got in touch. I found out that she teaches at the uh, Royal Academy of Performing Arts in Malaysia. She's a Muslim woman who then I had, I was performing in Singapore and I made the trip to go and meet her because I found it extraordinary that she would learn this piece where the dancer, it's a duet, Water Mysteries duet, the dancer's wearing uh, her, the shoulders are bare and it's long hair being uh, thrown around in, with water and she wanted to learn it and uh, and she did learn it and, and performed it in Malaysia in KL and I met her and she came and picked me up with she's fully dressed in headscarf and everything's covered but she got permission to perform this work now talk about cross culture cross uh you know, it became a, 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 a global language, which dance often is because you don't have to understand speech. And I was so moved. Okay, I didn't get paid a cent. And I kind of like, you know, oh, you know, it's nice. She contacted me through my composer. She wasn't doing that herself. So, you know, it's, a, I'm happy. I'm happy that it was it's disseminated. I'm happy that it, it was picked up. So, you know, that's a question of like how much access Vimeo, YouTube, uh, Instagram, TikTok, social media. Um, but at the same time, when you can protect and license your work uh, and can have and create income stream from it, which is more uh, amenable to uh, my late brother's photographs than to dance. Um, and so I think that those are all considerations and there are many different ways of looking at it and handling it. Yeah, um, I understand what you're saying. Cause uh, people call me and say, hey, I'm in Germany. There's some guys out here doing your routines. Uh, hey, I'm in Japan. There's some guys out here doing your routines. and and. I'm looking, I'm not looking at the monetary gain. Uh, I'm looking at the fact that they're actually doing it. So that to me was more rewarding than the monetary gains that the fact that this, this dance is, is, is spreading. That meant more to me than getting money for my work, uh, my body of work. The fact that somebody on the other side of the world is doing it. Are you talking, Luna, something in that nature as far as your composer is concerned? And they may be archiving your work. <laughs> like in KL, they, they actually videotaped the, her performance. Right. Uh, yeah. And, you know, that's part of my archive now. So, yeah. yeah. So I think, and I think what we're talking about are dialogues. Ultimately, archives create these dialogues about, and they also create the history that speaks to one another. And so your legacy, Marcus, and your legacy, Muna, are embedded within these other places because of that. And I, it makes me think of just to touch on something you had said, Muna, 
um, on the boards in Seattle, which is a presenting organization created on the boards TV, which is a beautiful um, way that they will document what's in what they um, they film like a three camera filming of whatever the performances are, as well as I think adding additional material. And they have create access for universities and individuals to actually see the work because that's part of the problem. If you're coming up as a student in a university, how do you know about the work that was done 10 years ago? Or so you're creating something, you're not creating something new. You're actually referencing something that may have been done prior. So that's part of the form of education that we need to have. And that we, I, I don't know if we always um, weave that into the educational system. The other thing I wanted to say was that, you know, when I was coming up, you know, the whole idea of recording was, you know, you have a VHS, the camera, the amount of money and cost was prohibited. Now people can just do it on their phones. On their phone. so, and the quality yeah. is actually much better in a certain way. So. Yeah. Now we're looking at, well, so now there's this accessibility because of the phone. How do you take that and use it? And how do you think about that? You know, I, and just going back to something that Mark had said, there's this beautiful dialogue and, you know, there are issues with it, the way Beyonce is using, whether it's Ana Teresa de Kirsmacher or Fosse or something else. Like these, she ends up actually shifting the, the language or Solange saying she wants to use some material from Trisha Brown in one of her performance pieces. Like you're starting to shift the, the popular language that using something that was considered probably avant-garde and not normally seen. So I think this dialogue in one way, um, we see how it's woven into change. And I think the question is, you know, how do we, you know, what do you give up? You know, Mark and Moon are like, oh, I'm giving up. It doesn't matter if I don't get paid. And I think that's also problematic within our field because our field is so um, kind of financially uh, underpaid and not invested within. And so how do we change that? That I think is actually a pivotal question. You, you work at the Museum of, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You understand the value of the archive and how the archive is actually invested in. Mm -hmm. and how that usage becomes commodified. And I'm curious to ask you, how do you see or imagine this kind of work being placed within that, quote, commercial or valued space? Um, that's a great, that's a great um, question and provocation to me. I, I'm fairly new at the, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art as a um, postdoctoral fellow, so I'm sort of like studying it. Um, mm -hmm. as opposed to being embedded in like a curatorial department, for example. Um, one thing that I was very interested to learn right away is that there is no, that each department operates with its own acquisition budget. And so um, they don't actively collect performance at this point. And so there is no budget for collecting performance, any kind of um, collecting for performance happens in the informal like archives system um, where there wouldn't be like a payment for um, the work itself you know it would be some documentation and because the institution has been so focused on objects over its whole history and um, it, it does not it has never focused very much even on maintaining records of its own um, of its own performances. So some of the performances, I'm, I'm thinking of Twyla Tharps in 1970 and Merce Cunningham did one in 1970. Um, those, those don't even exist in the archival record at the institution, um, which is incredibly surprising. You know, the archive is vast there in many ways. And to understand that these early performances that were important in certain ways don't, don't have an institutional footprint all of that was very, very surprising to me. Now, um, another source for my research has been um, MoMA, which does have collecting departments and they have recently established in the last 10 years, the Department of Media and Performance Art. And so they are collecting certain, um, certain performances. Um, I also have shared a link to an article that I wrote about their um, acquisition of Simone Forti's Huddle. 
um, which has a dual acquisition structure where it's in part maintained by the museum and it's in part maintained by the dance community. It is owned, it is legally and officially owned by both communities or both institutions. Um, but I guess, David, that's to say, that's a, that's a rather long-winded way of saying, like, it actually depends institution by institution. And then, of course, um, you know, Huddle's a really specific dance that operates something like an object, also something like a practice. Um, and um, certain forms are way less available or of interest. And, and um, <clears throat> those things are decided by, you know, gatekeepers at the institutions. Um, they're they're like way less either appropriate for or of interest to um, you know in certain certain practices. Um, so so obviously like the um, group associated with the Jets and Dance Theater because of its associations with the visual arts, you know, have been of far closer interest than say like classical ballet for example or indigenous forms or you know. And um, I can't speak for any curators that make those decisions, but um, but that's to say that it's it's varies per institution. Um, and each one has different structures. Um, that actually that. make that actually makes me that leads to this question of value of like why is this aesthetic valued and the other aesthetic not. That mm -hmm. is something that is underlying all of this. Like whether the value of recording a hip hop performance or Merce Cunningham, I actually performed at the Met uh, two years ago as part of a collaboration with Bill T. Jones and. Mm -hmm. Uh, Li Ming Wei, mm -hmm. and that was a three camera shoot. That was amazing. I mean, it was closed during the pandemic. And so this was a very special performance. Well, it actually wasn't totally closed. I take that back, but they put a lot of money into it because of, I don't know actually why they made that choice. I think partially it was to illuminate actions at the Met, but to me underlying that, that, that it's a question. It's a, mm -hmm. It's a concern. I think I, I, I'll say it more if it's a concern. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. I'm gonna, it looked like you were about to say something. Is that right? No, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. We have just we have just two minutes left in our in our conversation, and I'm I'm wondering if each of you has like a quick closing um, sign off or um, yeah, any final final sentences you want to say. Um, before we're done with this conversation, with our part of the conversation, there's a workshop after this. Yeah, Muna. Yeah, I'd like to say uh, just that in in um, being the uh, con responsible for for two archives, my own and my brother's, is that I'm not the person to judge what is to be kept. And a very good motto that I was um, given early on is keep everything. Keep everything because it's not for you to decide. Uh, and so, you know, the container idea that David brought up is like, you just have to contain it and preserve it. So don't throw those things away and don't undervalue your own work or what, you know, is there. Either it's uh, video or paper or or photos or uh, recordings of any sort, diaries, yeah. choreographic notes. Yeah, I right. agree with that. There yeah. could come a day that the Met or the MoMA is interested. You know, those things change over time. Yes, they do. And I, I mean, I consider you the forces that are making that change in your in your work and in your archiving work um yeah I, I appreciate very much those perspectives you bring to it and i oh. appreciate yours as well sorry you, yes. you go ahead mark sorry uh maybe seven years ago we did uh i was with the amherst ballet in massachusetts and we did a huge production of the nutcracker i played Grasumaya and i played the rat king so i was doing dual changing and backstage, but we did the whole production in breakdance. Amazing, amazing. We didn't change the music, you know, and um, it, was, it took so much to do the production of the Nutcracker in a breakdance form without taking from its classical attributes and um, 
it worked out well. But I still think as a break dancer, uh, we're only scratching the surface of what this thing is going to be with the 2024 Olympics coming up. Uh, break dance is going to be on the slate right now. And um, uh, there's a lot of more, a lot more documenting to do on my part. And um, I am so sorry I didn't document the first 20 years of my dance career, you know, and, but I, I did make some records back in the early 90s. And, and you can go out there and, and find that, but you can't go out and find my dance performances. So uh, I appreciate what you guys are doing, each one of you out there. That's what you're doing on your end. And um, the future looks bright for breakdance. I, th I think it does. And I'm hoping that um, Imogen and Hallie in their workshop can help us um, think about you know, practical tools of making this happen, of the documentation and, and organizing it and accessing it. So um, with that, I wanna thank you all and let them um, take over with their workshop. And um, yeah, thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, David, Muna and Zone for that incredible panel that was so fascinating and I have a million thoughts, um, but I am Imogen Smith. I'm the Director of Archiving and Preservation at Dance USA. I use she, her pronouns, and I am joining from Muncie Lenape land in Queens, New York. I am a white woman with long reddish brown hair. I'm wearing a black uh, top with flowery cutouts and a beige cardigan. And uh, my background is a white wall with a couple of uh, pictures hanging on it. Hi, everybody. I am Hallie Chemetsky. I use she, her pronouns. I am the archiving specialist at Dance USA. And today I am calling in from Lenape Ho King um, in East Harlem, Manhattan. I am a white woman with about shoulder length brown hair. Today I'm wearing a dark brown shirt and I have some orange slice earrings on. Um, I am here in my home bedroom slash office and over one shoulder I have some books and shelves and over the other some frames and things on the wall. Very happy to be here today. This is Imogen again. So now that everyone is thinking about your legacies and thinking about how you're documenting your work and how you might want to share it. We are gonna to try to share some very practical tips and advice about how to safeguard and organize your records so that they can support you in telling your story and shaping your legacy. So Hallie and I are Dance USA's archiving and preservation team. And we work with artists and dance organizations around the country on their archives, we provide free resources and workshops like this, as well as an affinity group for those who are interested in dance archiving. We will share our contact information and are always eager to hear from people who have questions or want to talk about anything archives related. And I want to start by stressing something that may seem obvious, but just to reiterate that archiving is not a one size fits all. And we are not here to impose a system. As we've heard, every artist thinks differently about what legacy means and about how they want their practice to be preserved. And archiving dance is particularly challenging and exciting because dance is an embodied and time-based form. So the aim is really to build an archive that reflects your unique creative practice or your, the culture of your organization. So when thinking about archiving, I think people often start by thinking, I have all this stuff, but we really recommend you start by asking, what is the story that you want to tell? And then thinking, what documentation do you have? Or what documentation do you not have but wish you had to tell that story? So in this workshop, we're gonna focus on the idea of independent artists and active dance companies as living archives. And that just means that you are probably already creating a lot of types of documentation and records of your work. 
And there are some very simple steps that you can take to ensure that those are safe and preserved and organized so that you can then use them in many different ways to support your creative endeavors. Because we have a very limited time, we're not really gonna get into talking about creating access or about long-term planning for where your archive ultimately lives. I know there is a session coming up on succession planning, um, but we are happy to take questions about any of that or anything archives related. So as we talk, please add your questions into the chat. We will get to as many of them as we can at the end of this session. And we will also be in the post-session chat room to answer more. Before we dive in, I, I do wanna again, acknowledge something obvious, which is that traditionally certain types of dance, particularly ballet and modern and larger white-led organizations have gotten much more resources and support in archiving and preserving their legacy. And that has left gaps and inaccuracies in access to dance history. So our aim in providing resources and training is really to empower people to ensure that their work and legacies and their communities are not either misrepresented or erased. As you think about what you wanna be saving, also we encourage you to consider that documents of creative process and contextual information, even in what may be imperfect forms, can be incredibly valuable, even if that's not what you maybe want to make public on your website or your social media. So this is one of the ways in which thinking about an archive is different from what you may be thinking of as your marketing materials. The main resource that we're going to introduce today and, and we'll be referring to this throughout is the Artist's Legacy Toolkit, which is a free suite of online resources about archiving aimed at independent artists and smaller companies. And I will hand it to Hallie now to talk about some first steps. Thank you, Imogen. This is Hallie again. So I do want to take a moment now to talk about some strategies first to ensure that your digital materials are safe. So I'm just going to cover some basic tips here and I will strongly encourage you to check out the digital files section of the artist's legacy toolkit for even more information. I just put the general toolkit link in the chat and we will also be putting links directly to the various parts of the toolkit that we're referencing, such as what Imogen just put in the digital files section. Um, and I really quickly want to make a note about the sort of copyright and sharing of digital materials that the panel was getting into. Um, like Imogen said, we just don't have time in this workshop um, to get into that. It could be like a multi long, multi hour long workshop of its own to talk about those issues. But please, if you have specific questions, we're happy to talk about your questions at the end, or you can always email us directly with your questions. Um, we are going to share emails at the end of this presentation. We do have some basic copyright information in the toolkit, and we have been interested in a good long while in creating even more resources and support for the dance field on rights issues because we know that it's a big issue for the field. Um, but before we um, can you know, share our materials, make them accessible, we simply have to make sure that those materials are preserved and don't disappear, right? So as we all know, the last many years have been almost entirely about the digital and your computer and your phone are probably full of photos and videos and grant proposals and artist statements and plenty of other documentation that needs safeguarding. Because that's just the thing, um, digital stuff is just as at risk and sometimes even more so as physical materials. I think sometimes we feel like digital stuff will last forever but then our hard drive crashes or a document that only exists one place gets edited or deleted and we are proven wrong. So the number one tip that I'd like to share to prevent that sad and stressful loss of digital materials is to have at least one backup of your digital materials. A backup might look like an external hard drive, or it might look like a cloud storage platform, something like a Google Drive, Dropbox, Backblaze, or one of many, many other cloud storage platforms that are out there on the market. Um, something quickly to note about cloud storage, 
You may be familiar with those platforms I just named, like a Google Drive or a Dropbox or something similar. And just something to keep in mind is that many people use those platforms for collaboration. So just be sure that if you do decide that one of those platforms is going to be your archival backup, you don't give other people permission to edit those files, or you only give people permission who you really, really trust not to tinker with them. It's important that your archival backup copy stays unedited. Um, so you might want to go with a hard drive or some sort of cloud platform that isn't as built for editing and sharing if you're not sure that all your coworkers and collaborators can follow the rules. So no matter what type of backup you use, the ideal system is having one copy of your materials that you consider your archival master copy, meaning that you never change it, you don't copy, make copies or edits or otherwise mess with the files in that copy. It's simply a safe storage location. The other copy, which for many of you might look like your personal computer or your work computer, that can be the one you use on a sort of day-to-day -day level. If you have the technical ability, an automatic backup is a really great way to ensure that your stuff is getting backed up without having to rely on your memory to do it. So moving on, I want to stress the importance of making sure that your digital files are findable. So just like you want to organize all those papers that are sitting around in boxes, you also want to make sure that you have a good records management system for your digital files so that you can identify them, and importantly, so other people can identify them. And that's really the best way to ensure that you're not accidentally deleting important files because they're in the wrong folder or they're not labeled correctly. Um, and it's also a really important first step to ensure that you have the ability to make your digital archives available um, either through your own means or potentially if you wanted to donate them sometime in the future. So um, an important step in that process is to always take a moment to rename files with a meaningful information filled file name. So you never just want to keep the automatic names like image one, two, three, four that your phone or maybe your camera will automatically give to photos and videos, for instance. For a material like a digital photo or video, you really want key information like the date, the venue, the photographer or videographer, and the name of the work right there in the file name. And the same goes for other types of documents. You want to give it a clear, meaningful name. And that way, the information and the material can't get separated. Also, if you can, you want to take some time to think about how someone other than you might go about locating and identifying your files in your system. If it seems to you like it would be utterly impossible for someone else to do that, you might want to take some time to figure out a clearer system of folders and file names that have enough information that even a stranger could figure it out. Um, please do take a look at the records management section of the Dance USA Artists Legacy Toolkit, which the direct link to that section is in the chat. This section has a bunch of tips on file naming and file structures and much, much more. So with that on digital files, I will pass it back to Imogen for some discussion of physical materials. Thank you, Hallie. Uh, this is Imogen again. So those of you who have been making work for many years in particular probably have a lot of physical materials that you have accumulated that might be photographs, notebooks, programs, audio and video tapes, costumes and props. Often this stuff piles up and it can seem daunting to start going through it. But taking time to organize your physical archives can both ensure that those materials are safe for the long term and allow you to start mining them and using them much more fully. The best place to start is with an inventory. Um, knowing exactly what you have and where it is will help you make more informed decisions about what you want to do with it and make it possible to find things much more quickly. And this can be a simple spreadsheet. Um, it 
is certainly a time consuming process. I won't lie to you, um, but this is something that you and any of your colleagues or volunteers can work on piecemeal. This doesn't have to be you know, a project that you do all in one go. Once you set up a system, you can then just sort of keep plugging away at it as you're able to. And in the toolkit, there are Excel templates for inventories, which you can download. You can customize those for your own use. And there's also guidelines and tips about how to inventory. But the most important thing is just to, once you establish a system, stick to it consistently. There are also some basic tips in the toolkit on how to store things safely. Um, you know, for different types of materials, what your, are the sort of minimum requirements you really want. There are also links to some other very helpful resources that Dance USA did not create, like the Preservation Self-Assessment Project, which is an online guide that has photos that can help you identify tape formats and also has pictures to help you recognize when materials might be starting to decay or um, are in need of some attention. Another thing that will be incredibly useful in the long term is to take time to label physical photos with the who, what, when, where, and who the photographer was. In the future, if you have photos that nobody knows what they're depicting or who took them, they really can't be used for research or even shared publicly. And this can actually be a really fun activity if you can gather some colleagues together who were involved in, you know, in the work at the time, spend some time going through these things together so you can crowdsource that information. And you might want to consider audio recording those sessions where you're sitting and going through things since looking through photos and archives often jogs people's memories and brings up great stories and you don't want all of that to just evaporate into the ether. Now, if you have older videotapes, you probably are already aware of the importance of getting those digitized as soon as possible since um, obsolescent formats and physical deterioration ultimately are gonna make those impossible to salvage. Um, and getting all of your tapes digitized can be expensive, but think about selecting a handful of your most important tapes Think about what would be the impact if you lost something. And doing that inventory of tapes first will help you make good decisions. It'll help you identify what duplicates you have, discover you know, what really seminal works are there, and what are the most unique and endangered things you have. Getting a few tapes transferred with a good reputable vendor isn't too expensive. And there are some community-based nonprofits that offer discounted services for artists. We do have a, a list of some of these in the toolkit. Ideally, you want to get your tapes transferred to preservation quality digital files, which are these very, very big so-called lossless formats. Um, from those, you can then make smaller file formats for access or broadcast quality. Um, but if that's not feasible, it is still really better to have an access quality digital file than nothing. So, you know, don't, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, just a, a tiny hint or tip about um, if you are going to funders and asking them for support with digitizing your tapes, really want to encourage you to make a case that is based on impact and on increasing access and talking about who outside of your organization will be able to access these materials once they're digitized? And what will the impact be? What is the, the story that is currently hidden that you know, can be made available through digitizing? That is really what funders are always looking for. Finally, once you get your tapes digitized, be sure to save those files in multiple places and follow that backup advice that Hallie gave. You really don't want to spend money getting things digitized and then have a hard drive crash and lose everything, which does happen. Just a couple more tips. First of all, please don't play your old videotapes, even if you still have an old VCR lying around. I know it can be tempting since sometimes you may not have full information about what's on a tape, 
you don't know what the quality is, and that makes it harder to make the decisions about what you want to get digitized. But older tapes that haven't been played in a long time can really easily get damaged, and they can damage or destroy your playback equipment. So if possible, please consult with a vendor, go to a library, or talk to an audiovisual preservation specialist to see if they can help you play your tape safely um, in, a, in a supervised setting. Also know that DVDs are not preservation medium, so they are really convenient for access, um, but you should never be copying your tapes to DVDs for preservation. And if you have DVDs in your collection that are unique, that's your only copy, please try to copy those onto a hard drive or on, into your cloud storage. Um, you know, if you can get access to a computer with a disk drive, you can just rip that content yourself and save it somewhere. That doesn't necessarily need to be done by a vendor, but DVDs are, can really easily get damaged and then there's really no way to recover that information. Lastly, um, if this all still really seems too daunting in terms of getting your tapes digitized, you don't have the funding, um, you might wanna consider another route of talking to a library about whether they can help. In some cases, if you do donate your tapes to a library, they may be able to help with digitizing them and then provide you with digital copies so that you still have a copy for your own use. I'll hand it back to Hallie now to talk a little bit about creating new documentation. Thanks, Emma Jen. This is Hallie. So before we open it up for some questions, I'll take a moment to address making sure that your archive is really reflective of your practice. So you want to think about all of the important aspects of your work. So you might be a choreographer, a performer, a community activist, an educator, a producer, and there may be many other facets of your work. And as Megan and David and Luna and Zone TDK talked about on their panel, it can be really difficult to predict which aspects of your work will be important to you and to other people down the road. So you wanna be generous and broad in your thinking about what parts of your work you want to save. It's usually not just the finished product that matters to your artistry. So you want to take time to think about what might be missing in your archives. What elements of your personal work and practice aren't reflected in the documentation that you currently possess? At the end of the day, the most important thing about your archive is that it tells your story. So as you're working to ensure that your archive tells your story, you can think about whether there are people like dancers, collaborators, family members, presenters, funders, or others who could have documentation that you are missing. Can you reach out to those people and get photos or videos or language that isn't in your personal archive? If you do end up taking in material from other people, just be sure that you have a clear understanding with them, ideally in writing about how those materials can and can't be used, and again, what the copyright situation is. And of course, you wanna make sure that any materials you take in, if they are digital, that they are integrated into your secure and safe backup system, and that files are named and filed away properly so that they don't end up disappearing. Finally, as we heard about on the panel, so much of dance is embodied and passed on from person to person rather than written on the page, which is a really beautiful thing about our dance practices. Um, however, it obviously can end up in some gaps in the record. And practices like doing oral histories can be a really great way to fill in that missing history and ensure that your archive represents the spirit of your work, especially the aspects that are more embodied or internalized. Um, we will put a link in the chat to an oral history resource. Um, and just know that doing oral histories does not have to be formal or elaborate. If this is the capacity you have, it can really just look like sitting down with someone over Zoom or in person and recording the conversation that you have on your phone. Just be sure that you document what you're doing. So the who, the what, the when, 
um, of that oral history from um, about you you're breaking up yeah Holly you are you're um, breaking up we're losing your audio chat so please um come over okay do you want to take over with with the end Imogen sure I know we are at time um we're just going to put our emails and the link to information about Dance USA's archiving services in the chat and encourage you to join us in the follow-up chat room if you have any questions where'd you get that futuristic name who me yeah imogen it's actually from a shakespeare play so it's it's very it's more archaic than futuristic <laughs> so i think that's we we will, we are are wrapping up. So if you want to um, take us out, Stephanie, um, thank you all so much for listening. And again, encourage everyone to contact us um, or join us now if you have questions. Yes, thank you, Dr. Metcalf, Zone, Muna, David, Imogen, and Hallie for this beautiful conversation. To our attendees, I hope you were able to take away some transformative ideas and considerations. A final thank you to our sponsors, to Janice Young from Viscardi Center and Lisa Reynolds and Michael Milley from Synexus for their invaluable support. Uh, we are heading over to the session follow-up chat in the community section to take a few questions and wrap up the conversation. Um, so what's next? Uh, one, you can move your bodies in our daily dance break facilitated and presented by King Bay Center for African and Diaspora Dance. It starts now. Or two, you can continue to experience the symposium. You can visit our sponsors in the exhibitor hall, create virtual meetups and online conversation at our community board, or take some time away from the screen and rest. Three, to explore more concepts within life cycles, livelihoods, and leg legacies. We have six more daytime sessions coming up. Three are held at 12 p.m. and three more are held at 2.30 p.m. At 1.30 p.m., you can take your lunch and or head over to the exhibitor hall for the virtual expo showcase. Tonight's program includes closing remarks from Dance Slash NYC, artistic offerings by the Clark Center and Hunter College Dance Department, and a pivotal keynote conversation entitled building community around dance for a future society. At an important global tipping point for change, this conversation forecasts what building community around dance will demand of the dance field and the wider society as we know it. Knowledgeable practitioners in technology, education, producing and presenting discuss the world they're preparing for and how they will serve it. We'll be joined by Adham Hafarez, Chris Walker, Camille Sinclair, and Christopher McDowell on the panel, and moderator Anozi Ozuzu. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>